So everyone, I'm very, very excited. Last last week, we shared clips from um, a WBAI uh, show about uh, Palestine and the West Bank. And one of the people who participated in that conversation was Tahani Mustafa. Tuhani is the senior Palestine analyst at the International Crisis Group, where she works on issues including security, socio-political, and legal governance in the West Bank. She holds a PhD in politics and international studies from the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. She is based between the UK, Jordan, and Palestine, and I'm very, very excited that Tahani was able to join us today. So welcome. Welcome, um, and check this you. out. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm I'm thrilled that you were able to to come on with us, Tahani. Thank you so much for the time and and all of your work. Um, after I listened to that WBAI piece, I actually took some time to to go through the site for the crisis group and what you all present. And there's so much information on there. Um, do you want to? talk to us first about like in general kind of what the crisis group does and what you do and 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 how how we're how we got to this place how you got to this place actually thank you uh so crisis group is in the business of conflict de-escalation um so we uh a lot of our, our recommendations a lot of our analysis is based on uh having their analysts based uh, in the field on the ground uh, we speak to everybody all stakeholders from the top down and we try and come up with pragmatic uh, workable solutions to to different conflict areas um, i work on the palestine file i've been working on the issue of palestine for the last 11 years and joined crisis group nearing now three years uh, and in that time we've uh, you know we've been working on things like the issue of succession and the need for Palestinian renewal. Uh, at that time, we also had uh, the unity and father, the cross-border conflict with Israel. And there was obviously, we couldn't, there was a lot of, uh, um, you know, internal movement within the Palestinian body politic uh, that we were still trying to, to get to grips with. And at that time, uh, we were also seeing signs of Hamas wanting to revert back to being a resistance movement. So it no longer wanted uh, that administrative control over Gaza, it, it had realized with time that its administration over Gaza was a complete failure. In that time, it's been marginalized from international and regional politics. Uh, ultimately, cons conciliatory politics that the PA was pursuing wasn't bringing Palestinians closer to statehood. Uh, so there was a lot of discussion, internal discussion within Hamas. Uh, Fatah itself, the governing party, was also starting to fragment. It's been slowly imploding, having very similar uh, discussions within it, you know, where, what is the best approach now to take given the ch ever-changing realities on the ground that has no longer made a two-state viable any longer. Uh, and within that time, we, we started to see a shift within younger generations of Palestinians who are moving towards uh, supporting and even to some degree engaging in armed resistance. You know, many of them had also had very similar opinions about conciliatory politics. They no longer felt like Israel was was a good faith partner to be working with. They didn't feel like Israel was really a partner to be engaging in a peace process with because when their leaders did go into any sort of, um, I wouldn't say negotiations, but when they did enter talks with the Israelis, they were offered meager economic concessions. Uh, but any kind of political promises were then, you know, completely revoked the very next day. You know, we saw that with the Aqaba summit back in February where Israel had promised to halt settlement expansion. It had promised to try to uh, clamp down on what at that time was becoming, um, or what we were seeing was an acceleration of settler violence. The very next day you had uh, senior Israeli officials come out and say that what happens in Jordan stays in Jordan, uh, that they, you know, that they made no such promises. We also saw a pogrom, what, you know, Israeli human rights organizations were describing as a pogrom on, on the Palestinian town of Hawara. A group of settlers had, had gone in and uh, basically attacked Palestinian residents that were there. They they burnt homes, properties. Uh, it was absolutely awful, but obviously nothing compared to what we're seeing today, which is daily pogroms at this point in time since the 7th of October. And at that time, I remember sitting, um, I was in Nablus. This was back in March, and I was sitting speaking to some of the members of the Lion's Den, a new armed group that had propped up. 
composed of young Palestinians between the ages of 18 to 30. And we were trying to gauge what their rationale was. You know, what, what was it that led to the rise of this new phenomenon? Uh, especially as the PA and Israel were claiming that this was the biggest threat to their security in, in you know, since the Second Intifada. And we were starting to see a lot of uh, international, especially US investment in the coercive capacity of the PA. And these Palestinian, you know, these young Palestinian boys, uh, you know, despite what, what a lot of international observers were claiming, or despite what the media was even claiming, you know, that they were desperate and frustrated and economically deprived and, uh, you know, irrational. They were actually, you know, very, very articulate, well-educated. A lot of them didn't come from the poorest segments of their communities, but they had a very, very clear political understanding of what their reality was. And many of them felt stuck. They felt that there was no positive political horizon. Now, fast forward to the 7th of October, and that is a very similar sentiment that we saw come out from Gaza. You know, Hamas had reached a point of desperation. Uh, they no longer wanted to engage in this cyclic, cyclic process whereby you have a, a continued blockade of the Gaza Strip. Israel offers mega concessions, which it uses as a carrot and stick to pressure Palestinian leaders when it wants to. Palestinians get frustrated. They fire a few rockets over the border. Sometimes it, 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 it ends up leading into a, a, a cross-border skirmish. But ultimately, things don't change, change. Things don't shift. And so that is pretty much how we've ended up here today. It's the complete failure of, of not only a peace process that has, you know, that, that was almost a failure to begin with because it never actually acknowledged. There was no acknowledgement of Palestinian sovereignty or national rights. Uh, what was offered was Palestinian autonomy. And over time, we have seen that. We have seen that transpire. Uh, we've seen Palestinians lose more land, lose more rights. They've become fragmented, not only geographically, but also amongst themselves. And they've now hit a point of, of desperation, almost nihilistic resistance, if you like. Does, uh, I'm, I'm just, sorry, Renee, I, go ahead. I didn't, I, I'm just wondering, I don't know much about the crisis group that, that you work with, but I'm just wondering in the context of all, and I don't even know if, if you're able to answer this, but in all that the crisis group deals with globally, where does what's happening now with Palestine stack up, so to speak? Where does it where does it uh, rank among the the crisis group's set of crises, both in terms of what's happening now and then historically? And then I, I know this is a difficult question to to follow up with or to, for any of us to answer. But then what what is it that that the world should be doing, or 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 does the crisis group encourage that the world do? Well, in, so again, prior to the 7th of October, I mean, we were trying to warn policymakers that something, that the, the situation was completely unsustainable and something was going to implode. You know, it, we didn't know what, we didn't know how, but this was a warning uh, we were pr pretty much trying to reiterate through a lot of our outputs. If you go back and look at a lot of the statements we were putting out, a lot of the reports we were putting out, uh, we were trying to, to warn that, you know, ultimately the status quo is no longer sustainable. There needs to be a change of policy. Uh, the two state is no longer viable. It has become nothing more but a talking point uh, that there needs to be serious, serious policy shifts towards Palestinians. Palestinians want political renewal. They are pushing for political renewal. Um, there is no longer a legitimate leadership that Palestinians feel can effectively advocate them on the political stage, which is pushing many towards drastic armed resistance and violence. There is an incredibly violent Israeli occupation, uh, even made even worse now with the extreme right wing government. Uh, and all of this just almost fell on deaf ears, unfortunately. And part of that was because of the lack of, of, of a better policy from the international community. It wasn't that they didn't acknowledge that a lot of what we were saying was, was fact. It wasn't that they you know, it didn't acknowledge the fact that the two state was pretty much dead. Um, it was just the fact that they couldn't come up with better policies at that point. And it wasn't for a lack of technical solutions either. It was because no one had the political will to do what, what was required, which was to put pressure on Israel. You know, Israel knows that it can behave with complete impunity. It has been proven that time and time again. And we're seeing that even today. I mean, okay, it, we, don't, we don't want to talk about the issue of Gaza for now, but if we just look at the West Bank as a good example of that, the West Bank had nothing to do with the 7th of October, and yet you're seeing 3.2 million people subject to some of the worst collective punishment since the Second Intifada. Uh, since the 7th of October, you've seen over, near enough, just over 230 Palestinians killed just from Israeli search and arrest operations. Israel has been conducting a mass arrest campaign where they have managed to arrest 
just from the 7th of October alone, 3,100 Palestinians. Those Palestinians are being tried in military courts. They are being put in, in administrative and security detention. Uh, you know, it's, it's, we're seeing an uptick in settler violence. Again, prior to the 7th of October, the UN was reporting that this is probably the worst year we've seen for settler violence, where we were seeing something like three serious cases a day. And by serious cases, they meant physical assault. That's never mind, never mind the kind of psychological, uh, verbal abuse uh, that Palestinians face on a daily basis from settlers. That number has now, uh, has now um, sorry, increased by seven attacks a day. You're talking about seven physical attacks a day. So far, since the 7th of October, we've had eight Palestinians killed just by settlers alone. Uh, we've seen movement restrictions between different towns, villages, cities. I'm sorry, that's just in the West Bank. I just want to... Just in the West Bank. Uh, since, the world, sorry, since the world's attention has been diverted to Gaza, um, this is what Israel has now managed to do in the West Bank. Since the 7th of October, they shut down all exits and entry points into West, the West Bank towns, uh, cities, and villages. Uh, in some cases, in Area C, which is 60% of the West Bank, which, which is under full Israeli control, uh, we saw the national security minister, Ben Gavir, who uh, had armed, uh, sorry, given additional arms to settlers who are already armed, uh, something like 14,000 weapons, and they have used that to form militia groups or what they call security squads. And they are using that to man the exit and entry points of Palestinian towns and villages, which means anyone trying to leave or enter are subject to attacks. Uh, not only that, we've also seen uh, a limitation in terms of Palestinians being able to access their farmlands, which means that, you know, fresh produce, food, uh, access to basic uh, services, that's all been very much limited. In some cases, it's turning into a serious humanitarian crisis in, in some areas, including East Jerusalem. Uh, Palestinians have been forbidden from praying. Young Palestinians below the age of 60 have been forbidden from praying in the Al-Aqsa Mosque since the 7th of October, on Friday, their holiest day. And that was also one of the reasons Hamas gave for its attack on the 7th of October was the lack of freedom of worship. And what we have seen from the international community so far have been words of condemnation, but no action. Um, I, thank you. So part of what made me reach out to you is exactly what you said, because there, there had been this clever focus only on Gaza and only on October 7th, and in doing so, and in completely ignoring what was happening in the West Bank, which, you know, in that interview, you said the numbers of Hamas, the, the relation of Hamas within the West Bank was so small that that could not be the excuse for what was happening in the West Bank. And so in, in focusing only on Gaza and Hamas, it allowed Israel to continue what they were doing in the West Bank, which they could not blame on Hamas, but because no one was talking about it, right, it, it, it continued to happen. And now you have this entire situation that has nothing to do with the quote unquote terrorism, right? But it's still, you're still destroying the property, just killing the people, the genocide, the, like all the things that were happening in the West Bank and no one was talking about it. Um, and I, I feel like, you know, in my, in my opinion, that was the proof to me that this really had nothing to do with quote unquote terrorism. It had nothing to do with the fear of Israeli lives. It, had no, it was really about the land grab and the genocide and the removal of the Palestinian people from, the, from their ancestral lands. So I really wanted, it was so important to me to have someone who was an expert who could really speak to what was happening. Um, outside of that, you mentioned the, the non-viability of the, the, the two state, which I have completely, I'm in complete agreement with, but can you explain a little more um, for the audience, like why this two state solution, which now all of a sudden they're bringing back as a, a conversation piece, right? Now we're going back to, oh, we'll have a two state solution. And no one understands that the two state solution is done. There is no two state solution that cannot be possible, but can you explain a little more about why that's no longer a viable option? Sure. So I just want to go back to a point you made, and thank you for, for also just um, bringing that to my attention as well. I think it's also just worth pointing out that in, in this time as well, you've had 15 Palestinian communities also displaced in the West Bank just from settler violence um, and, and, and the violence on their properties and also persons. Uh, we've had, uh, you know, 
part of that has also been the fact that international observers and human rights groups are not able to get to the ground at the moment because those that do try are also being subject to attacks. Uh, and in many cases, even the Palestinian Authority who has tried to go onto the ground to document what's happening have been subject to attacks. I think Haaretz put out a very good piece uh, from an Israeli human rights organization that actually documents the torture that those two PA officials who tried to go to Hebron to document some of the, the violence and one of the communities being displaced had been subject to when they were kidnapped, robbed, and then subject to about 14 hours of torture, uh, one of which was almost sodomized. You know, and, and you're talking about members of the Palestinian Authority. These weren't even just residents of the community that were being displaced. Uh, so, you know, it, 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 it is, you know, it is incredibly, um, you know, questionable when Israel claims that it's trying to dislodge Hamas and an entity like Hamas from, from governing Gaza when you see what it's actually doing in the West Bank as well. Uh, you know, and, and the kind of crisis that it's now inflicting and, and, and the front that it's now opening up in the West Bank. And it's also just worth considering, like, as you said, Hamas is not in the West Bank. Uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, their numbers don't don't really total more than 4,000 in the West Bank out of a population of 3.2 million. A lot of those that are being driven into armed resistance are actually from the Fatah uh, uh, group, you know, uh, who have lost a lot of uh, faith in their own top tier of, of, of their leadership. Uh, and, you know, so they're, they're turning to more radical elements like Hamas and Islamic Jihad that are willing to equip them, provide them with the logistics in order to, to push back against the, an incredibly violent occupation that, as I mentioned earlier, has shown them that maybe conciliation just isn't the right path to go down when you have that sort of partner for peace, uh, quote unquote, partner for peace, um, which then brings us to the two state solution. Now, I mean, a lot of Palestinian historians and I think even you know Israeli historians who have been critical of, of, of the two state uh, track have, have kind of reiterated this probably better than I can. Um, but ultimately, you know, the peace, the peace process itself failed. Um, it failed a long time ago. It failed from the outset. And, and that is primarily because when Israel speaks of Palestinian statehood, it doesn't speak of it in the sense of sovereignty. It speaks of it in the sense of autonomy, which means that Palestinians will have limited ability to, administer, to, to provide administrative services to themselves. But total control of the land remains with Israel, which is why Palestinians had rejected the Os what, what was offered at Oslo uh, prior to that in Madrid and D.C., now, Arafat had decided to enter direct negotiations with Rabin at the time, uh, and that's how we ended up having the, the implementation of the Oslo Accords, which set up the Palestinian Authority and then the, obviously the, the different land designations for the West Bank, uh, where 60% remained under full Israeli control, 18% uh, uh, remained under uh, full Palestinian Authority control, but with the exception whereby Israel reserves for, it, for itself the right to what it calls hot pursuit, which means that at any time, without needing to provide any kind of evidence. It is able to conduct in incursions, arrests, targeted assassinations, if it feels like its security is under threat. Uh, and then the remaining of the West, the remainder of the West Bank, Area B, uh, is, is shared between Israel and, and the PA. The PA provides administrative services like medical education uh, and sanitation, and then Israel retains full security control over Area B as well. Uh, so that that was essentially the the the, the offer um, that it, that Palestinians were afforded. Now I say afforded because it wasn't really a peace process, especially when you talk about these symmetries of power here, where one side speaks and dictates um, the peace terms. That becomes a dictation of surrender ultimately. Not it's not really a process. Uh, and you know that facade or that mirage really started to fall apart after in the, in the first five years, and that's how you ended up having the the second intifada. You know, Palestinians started to realize what it ultimately was. And many had already, you know, figured out what it was from the outset, which is why there was a lot of opposition to it. But they went along with it on the promise that it was meant to be an interim arrangement. It didn't turn to fruition like that. Uh, and that's how you ended up having the second intifada. Since then, uh, you know, in the international community have continued along that track. So when they talk of a two state solution, it is within the parameters of the Oslo Accords, which is what I've just detailed out for you. In that time, you've also had the expansion of Israeli settlements. Now, Oslo didn't do anything to stop Israeli expansionism or settlement building. It didn't do anything to guarantee the rights of Palestinian refugees. It didn't do anything to guarantee a contiguous Palestinian territory. Palestinians were not afforded full control of their own land, air and sea space, either the, in the West Bank or in Gaza. Um, it did not give them control over their own resources like water. And now we've just discovered that there are like now gas fields uh, in, in Gaza. It did not give them full control of their own economy. 
through the Paris Protocols, the Palestinian economy is very strongly tied to the Israeli economy, uh, which means they even use Israeli currency if you go to the occupied territories. Uh, again, you know, in terms of security, Palestinians were not allowed to or were not permitted to have a, any kind of militarized state. So it would be a completely demilitarized state, which means that the best they could hope for was a policing force. But even then, the logistics of that would be dictated by Israel. So at the moment today, when you talk about the Palestinian Authority security forces, you're talking about a policing squad who has probably, they're allowed to carry things like pistols, for example. Um, even vehicles, you know, they're not allowed to have proper armored vehicles. When you talk about bulletproof vests, they're not allowed to have uh, vests that are impenetrable, impenetrable sorry, to, to Israeli bullets. Um, which makes it kind of humorous when Israel claims the PA isn't doing enough to stop militants in the West Bank when they're using looted guns from Israel. And then that's the best you're really equipping them with. And by the international community's own admission, you know, what the Palestinians ask for, um, you know, in terms of what they can give them is ultimately up to what Israel will allow, right? Um, so everything goes through the Israelis, everything, anything that goes in and out, anything that is given to the Palestinian Authority has to go through Israel. It needs to be pre-approved by Israel. And that was pretty much the arrangement that Oslo has set out. And that, that has very much, you know, stayed intact. Uh, at the same time, you've had triple the number of, sorry, number of settlers that, that you had since the outset. So since the 90s until today, you started off with 150,000 settlers in the West Bank. Today, there are now 750,000 settlers in the West Bank. And so, again, when you talk about the two-state solution, you know, how are you going to undo? I mean, first of all, what, what are you going to do with all those settlers? Right? They're not going to go willingly. Also, those settlements don't build themselves. Settlers are given very good financial incentivization from their own government. They don't have to pay for anything. They're actually quite literally paid to go live in these plots of land that are given to them. Um, you know, they are given free housing, land, resources. So how are you going to undo that? How are you going to make these different uh, little patches of territory into one contiguous territory? Since since the Oslo Accords, since uh, the, the mid 90s until today, the West Bank and Gaza have been completely cut off from each other. If you are a Palestinian from Gaza, regardless of whether you have a Palestinian passport or not, and this was prior to Hamas's takeover, you still needed a special permit in order to go visit the West Bank, right? And this was prior to 2006. Um, so again, it, w when we talk about the two-state solution, like I said, it's a talking point. When the international community talks about it, they're basically saying we're going to take things back to the status quo, right? We're, we're going to bring everything back to, to things being quiet, Palestinians, you know, having an administrative body to keep them quiet. Uh, Israel can retain its full control through a very sophisticated lexicon of security for Israel's security. Palestinians, again, will need to prove that they are able to behave well enough in order to guarantee their own statehood, because that is basically the premise of Oslo, which is um, it was first and foremost intended to guarantee Israeli security before final status negotiations could then go ahead. And like I said, the, the final status negotiations on offer are precisely the parameters I've laid out, which is why it's been completely unacceptable for many Palestinians. So when Palestinians talk about a two-state solution today, those that do favor a two-state solution do not favor it within the parameters of Oslo. And their concern is not so much a two-state or one state. Their concern is, even if they were to live under a one state with Israel, what can guarantee that their rights will be respected? Or are we in a de facto situation whereby we're, we're practically in a one state, but under a system of apartheid? And then, you know, there are those that are concerned with what that means for their national rights, if that does become the permanent status quo. I think you said it there. That's what it means, apartheid. Uh, you know, Renee and I talked a little bit earlier about the the recent uh, controversy around the Harvard Law Review censoring uh, a, a, an article pointing to the genocide that's occurring. And we've covered here recently uh, Greenblatt and the ADL promoting their a public relations crisis that that Zionists in Israel has a public relations crisis that the world, particularly young people, are not following the traditional message, uh, and yet we still are where we are. So I'm wondering how you and and maybe some of your colleagues uh, are assessing the 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 propaganda wing of this struggle, uh, uh, Israel's crisis and concern, uh, what seems to be 
Well, let me ask you: How do you how do you all see it? How do you or or do your you and your colleagues see the 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 ongoing propaganda battle? I think this war has been somewhat different in terms of the way that it's been incredibly polarizing for many, and you know, not to say that this this subject hasn't been you know polarizing for the last seventy five years, but I think there's something about this war, what happened on the seventh of October, and and the the subsequent framing. Um, of, of Palestinian resistance and, and an organization like Hamas, which has made it even more polarizing than usual. And, you know, I would be lying if I said that even us as ICG didn't have those, you know, internal kind of schisms between us, uh, you know, in terms of what was the appropriate language to use from the outset, uh, what was the kind of outrage, what, we should, what was the messaging we should have been putting out, um, you know, what, what were we meant to be advocating here? Um, and I think, you know, that there has obviously been, but this isn't something that started on the 7th of October, this has obviously been something that has been ongoing for quite a while, but that conflation between any criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism. But this time round, I think it has been incredibly difficult to really put out any positive messaging uh, towards the Palestinians without being conflated as, as a Hamas appeaser or as an anti-Semite. You know, and I think many spaces now have become very, very hostile, uh, whether you're talking about you know, universities, uh, think tanks, media, uh, you know, things are starting to, to change a little bit, but the shift just hasn't been enough. And so for many of us who are trying to historicize, con contextualize, uh, it has been an incredibly hostile space. You know, I, I, again, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't. And that is still something that many of us um, in this space are still trying to figure out amongst ourselves. Um, in order to get that messaging across without being struck down as, you know, a terrorist sympathizer or an anti-Semite, right? Um, you know, it, it was absolutely ludicrous. I mean, never mind the accusations and the appropriation of terms that have been around for so long, like when Palestinians call from the river to the sea, that was a response to the Israeli right wing's call from the river to the sea, which would call for a full Jewish ethno-national state from the river to the sea. Palestinians, on the other hand, that was a response to that call, where they, when, when they, when they appropriated that from the Israeli right wing, their call was for Palestinians to have equal rights, like everyone else from the Mediterranean Sea, sorry, from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. And yet somehow that discourse has been flipped on Palestinians as though we were the ones advocating for an ethno-national state, which was never the case. Uh, you know, to have things like your national symbols, like the kofia, for example, conflated with a swastika, which was absolutely outrageous. Uh, to have groups like Hamas being conflated with ISIS and the Taliban, you know, claiming that Palestinians need to be liberated from these people. Gaza, just as a good example of that, Gaza has some of the most well-educated women. You know, Israel actually killed the, the high... The, 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 the young girl that scored the highest in her high school uh, uh, exams, she was killed by Israel in, in, in an airstrike, <laughs> right? Um, if you, anyone who has been to Gaza, anyone who has been to the occupied territories um, can very much easily testify that, you know, Hamas is not ISIS, Hamas is not the Taliban. Women work, women are educated. Um, there may be some consult, co sorry, cultural conservatism that may be not necessarily ideal, but what Palestinians currently need liberating from is not Hamas, it's from an incredibly violent Israeli occupation that gives relevance to groups like Hamas, right? The West Bank is not Hamas, but as I described, the reality there doesn't sound that significantly different from the misery that people experience in Gaza. You know, if Gaza is the world's biggest open air prison and the West Bank is the world's biggest closed door prison, right? Um, you know, Palestinians have an authority that is secular in the West Bank. You can wear short dresses, you can date, you can drink, whatever. That doesn't mean their lives are any better. That doesn't mean that they have different demands to those in Gaza. Um, and, you know, just to conflate an organization like Hamas, Hamas wasn't calling for this conflict to trans, uh, sorry, to transcend the borders of Palestine. Uh, you know, at their core, they are a resistance movement. Uh, you know, the, the, the lack of acknowledgement, which is incredibly infuriating. Uh, yes, their 1988 charter was extremely uh, outrageous and, and problematic, but bear in mind, it was written by a group of fundam fundamentalists who were born and raised in refugee camps. Uh, you know, they had grown up uh, in two different wars, 48 and 67. 
where their families and their relatives were displaced by an incredibly, in, in an incredibly violent process and had to grow up in refugee camps. Now, that's not, an, that's not a justification, but that context is important to know where that charter came from. Uh, and then not to mention that, okay, you, again, you, you know, like I said, their charter was incredibly problematic in 1988, but clearly Hamas had proved to be pragmatic enough for the international community to allow them to partake in those elections in 2006. And then when they won and Israel and Fatah didn't like the results, they preempted a coup. Um, but in any case, in 2017, they did renounce that charter. They reformulated their charter where they recognized the difference between Judaism and Zionism, where they made it very clear that they would accept a state on, uh, based on a two-state solution, the 1967 borders, uh, where they made it clear that, okay, they don't recognize Israel's right to, to exist, which neither does Israel, by the way. Uh, but they do recognize that Israel is a reality that's not going to shift. So it's just something we now have to work with. There is a reality that they have to work with even if that means accepting a Palestinian state within the 1967 borders. Uh, they have tried conciliation before. Uh, Israel has torpedoed two of those. The most prominent example was in 2012, where they killed their lead negotiator. Uh, and then that's what led to the 2014 war. Um, you know, you've, you've had numerous cases where Israel has broken every single ceasefire. They have a history of breaking ceasefires with Hamas. Uh, even today, this current humanitarian pause within the first hour of that humanitarian pause, they were already shooting at Palestinians trying to move from the south into the center and north to try and see if there was anything left of their homes. Uh, at the same thing, and, and they're still continuously, they're doing that still now. Uh, when you had the hostage exchange and release, they were still conducting mass arrest campaigns in the West Bank. So while they may have released something like a couple of, a handful of Palestinians, they had still arrested something like over 90 Palestinians yesterday. Uh, you know, no one had really questioned what those Palestinians were doing in administrative detention to begin with. No one had even questioned what administrative detention is, which means you are arrested without charge or trial, and you are you are left there indefinitely. And that could be from anything between six months to, to years. Uh, no one had actually questioned what the conditions would be or, or whether there was any guarantee that those Palestinians won't be rearrested, which has happened before um, when you've had a, 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 an exchange whether they'll be rearrested once Israel gets all those hostages back. Israeli hostages were allowed to celebrate their release. You know, there were things waiting for them, like doctors and toys and, and families. Palestinian prisoners, their families were warned that anyone who celebrates would be subject to a $19,000 fine and their family, their family member would be rearrested. They were prevented from congregating outside the prisons, waiting for family members. They, they had uh, tear gas fired at them. Uh, and at the same time, um, if you look at the 300 on the list that are meant to be exchanged, something like 260 of those are children. You're talking about Palestinians under the age of 18. You know, it's absolute, you know, it's absolute madness the way that. I'm sorry, just quickly, I, did I, you said something a minute ago about Hamas coming, obviously, to recognize you said so. I, 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 I'm not clear what you were saying. You said Hamas recognized Israel, but does not recognize Israel, but Israel does not either. Did I hear you correctly? I'm sorry. Could you? No. So Hamas doesn't recognize Israel's right to exist, but it does it recognize that Israel exists. Okay. And so it is now a reality that they need to simply work with. Okay. Sorry. I think I thought I heard something else. Okay. Thank you for that. Right. Right on. Sorry, Renee, just, go ahead. No, it's fine. And I just, so, and, and there's a couple of questions in the chat and I know we're limited on time and I don't want to hold you too, too long. Um, but you use the word secular, which caught my eye because <laughs> someone in the chat has been asking if you can speak to the use of that word with regard to the one state solution. And does the word secular make a particular distinction within that conversation? Um, so when Palestinians talk about one state, they're not talking about a religious or ethno nationalist state. They're just talking about a state where everyone, including Israelis, which means that they do acknowledge now that Israel is, a, again, a reality um, that isn't going to shift. Right. Um, so every, so it's a simple recognition that Palestinians want to live within an Israeli state, uh, but that they want to live with equal rights and freedoms, just like every other Israeli, which at the moment you do not have. You have a class system of citizenship where Palestinians rank below Mizrahi Jews, which, you know, Mizrahi Jews are, are Middle Eastern Jews, and then you have Ashkenazi Jews who are European, 
Jews, and even there you have a, a, a citizen-based uh, uh, ethnic kind of system whereby Mizrahi Jews, again, are afforded less opportunities than those of Ashkenazi origin. Uh, and then obviously Palestinians rank far, well, well below all, all three categories uh, where they're not afforded similar rights or access to state services, um, where they can have at any moment their citizenship easily revoked, where they live in, in, in squalid conditions, where uh, you know, their communities, their neighborhoods are not afforded similar state services or even similar state investments. Uh, you know, it, it is it is a serious system of, 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 of effective apartheid. And so when Palestinians call to live in a one state, they want to live in a one state where they are granted, where everyone is granted equal and fair rights. And you don't have this kind of citizenship system or, 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 or sorry, citizenship based system. Um, now, for some Palestinians, their concern for those that oppose the idea of a one state, it, it's based on two premises. The first is they're concerned what that ultimately means for their national rights. And there are some that feel like Israel won't behave in good faith and may actually end up being able to repress them uh, easily in a one state system as, as they can in a two state system, right, where they won't be afforded equal, uh, fair, equal um, rights as, as, as other Israeli citizens. And so you could effectively just have the, the this apartheid um, system become uh, uh, an entrenched reality for all Palestinians. And then there are others that worry about, you know, they worry about what that means for their national rights, but there's also a history of, of dispossession, of living under oppression, where many of them don't necessarily want to become Israeli citizens. They don't want to live with Israel. There is a history of trauma there that makes them you know, very reluctant to want to live amongst Israelis, and they'd rather have that separation. Which is why when we talk about apartheid, sorry, apartheid, it's not the most effective operative term when we talk about liberation for Palestinians, precisely because of that division. Uh, for those that live within Israel, that does describe their reality to a T. But for those that live in the occupied territories, apartheid is just one mechanism of, of a broader process of settler colonialism. And there are those that would rather have that separation rather than live in a one state. And so for them, the battle becomes defeating or, or dismantling, sorry, settler, the, the entire settler colonial um, system rather than just one element of it, which is apartheid. Thank you. And if I could just ask one last question, and then I know we have to let you go. It's sorry, Jared, I don't know if you also had one last question. <laughs> Many. But we'll just, we just, I know we'll, we'll have to bring, have we'll have to, yeah. now that I have your contact, you'll hear from me again and we can, we can have more, more conversation. Um, there, there's, and, and part of what I like to discuss here is, is really the, the entire premise of imperialism and the empire and how we're all fighting the same battle. And one of the questions that has been happening in the chat is, what are you aware, if anything, if there are conversations between some of the allied forces, maybe in Africa or other places that are not aligned with Israel? And is there any work being done, you know, with conversations between the Palestinian leadership or voices or anyone who is trying to have these conversations with those African nations, with those other allied states, with other people in the UN who don't ally with with the US and, and the UK? Are you are you familiar or aware of any of that happening? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, never mind the Palestinian leadership. I think at this point, the Palestinian leadership has been so horribly co-opted um, to the extent where they no longer think in terms of national interests. They're very, very self-interested. And that is, you know, that, that, that has been part of this disconnect between their constituency base uh, and, and the top tier of, of, of the leadership is that they cannot no longer relate to the reality on the ground any longer which is why Palestinians don't feel like they have advocates any longer. You know, they don't, I mean, if, if we look at today, what we're seeing unfold in Gaza is one of the biggest humanitarian disasters of our time. Uh, you know, people have described it, even genocide scholars uh, have decided, sorry, scholars of genocide have, just, have described what's happening today as, as a genocide. And yet where has the PLO or, or the Palestinian leadership been? They've, they, they've been very much silent, completely marginalized. Uh, they've been very much focused on their short-term survival. They, where they have allowed rallies, they've had to be pro-regime rallies, just like you're seeing across the Arab world. Um, in some cases, they've managed to arrest people that have tried to to, to kind of um, uh, uh, push back against Israeli security forces. They did that quite a lot during the the first few weeks of the war. Uh, 
uh, until Israel then started doing it, doing it themselves, basically, um, which is where we saw an uptick in, in mass arrest campaigns. Um, so Palestinians don't feel like they have a leadership. So right now, a lot of those efforts are coming from the grassroots. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, it is not a united grassroots. Palestinians are more fragmented today than they ever have been. So there are a lot of efforts, but they are very fragmented. But they certainly are looking towards now the global south. Uh, you know, the, the Western international community have proven themselves to no longer be impartial brokers, if, if you ever could call them that. Um, but it's become so starkly obvious at this point that their faith in, in, you know, if we talk about trying to guarantee Palestinian rights, it's not going to lie with the international community. That is not something that they will push or advocate for. So, yeah, I mean, you know, there are now movements being built uh, that are looking towards the global south, like Africa, Latin America, allies in Southeast Asia. And that process is, is, is start, sorry, starting to slowly build itself up. Um, you know, I, I wish I could talk more about it, but I'm not really involved in those kind of activist circles. That's not really what ICG does, but um, they are definitely there. And, and, and uh, you know, whether, whether those circles can start, whether, whether those circles or, or you know, those allies um, have enough leverage within the international system in order to, to really make some kind of serious operational impact on the reality of Palestinians um, is something that we'll, you know, maybe hopefully see, but it's still very early to determine. Thank you. Thank so you very, very much. much. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much. It was it was it was great uh, virtually meeting you and having you come through. And please uh, answer Renee's emails ASAP okay. and come back again. <laughs> I will. Thank you so much. Uh, no, sir, thank yeah, you, Tahani. Have a great day. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You yeah peace. Right Bye. On.